Welcome to the Chef United way. It's about almost time for the two worst clubs in the Premier League to go head to head. But there's another rivalry that the Blades fans have been talking about for a long old time. Harmer versus Berger. Hamer versus Berg. Hammer versus Burge. That last one, nobody should ever say. Anyway, let's crack on. Let me bring in Mr. Ollie Man. How are you doing, sir? I am very good. Thank you, Nick. I have come back from a holiday and I want to say I'm refreshed. And so I am, because otherwise I'm going to fall into a vault of depression about the fact that I'm not still in America watching WrestleMania. So I'm OK, Nick. How are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm good, thank you. I've definitely not had the worst day in the world. And I've definitely not been bending your ear about it a second ago. But let's crack on into talking about the Blaze, because that's why everybody's here. So tonight, me and you will be chatting through the stats, the similarities and the differences and finally deciding who, deciding who came off the best, the Blades or Burnley. So firstly, Burnley signed Sander Berger on the 9th of August, 2023. 2023. Um, how did you feel when he officially left? Yeah, it was such a weird one, wasn't it? I think, obviously, we were still raw and we were really starting to think that we'd thrown a season away. And I think that was the worst thing. I think we thought... I think I thought we could improve on Sander. I think I, when he was leaving, when he was here, I'd given him a lot of stick. I think I was really one of those fans who wanted to see a little bit more from him, really wanted to see more impact from him in games. And I think even in the championship, he'd always left us wanting a little bit more. He'd struggled with his injuries. And so I wasn't sad that he was leaving. I was absolutely distraught at the timing that he was leaving because letting him go when we did, right on the eve of the season... I mean, well, we've done that to death. But again, a lot of why we're in this mess we're in right now is because we let all our players leave the first week of August like a bunch of morons. But other than that, I think as a player, I wasn't distraught to see him leave. As a fan, I was distraught at the timing. Yeah, I think actually that what you've just said, the reason why we're in all this mess, you could actually date it back to when we were signing loads of 20 plus million pound players when we thought we were at our peak um and Sander Berger is one of those players I'm not saying he was a a bad player I'm just saying that he was one of those players where we thought do you know what we can stretch the budget to uh, 20 million 24 million and it, all, yeah. it all started you know I'm not I'm not gonna say that Sheffield United life peaked at Crystal Palace away <laughs> But Crystal Palace away was a very, very high point that I'm not sure we ever reached the highs of again. No, no. And I think that's why Sander Berger actually stayed at Sheffield United for way longer than what he expected because I think he fell in love with the club on that day as Crystal much as we away. fell in love with him. <laughs> but anyway, let's crack on. I want to... Yeah, I, do you know what I'm going to say, actually? Um, when I did the uh, overlap, with Gary Neville and, uh, and Jamie Carragher, obviously got to drop. Oh, did that you in. did you do the overlap, Nick? I did do the overlap. You, believe did you? Yeah, I did. You've well, mentioned it all year. Saying that, saying that, I did get about a minute and a half of it, and yeah. I did. Did I you get invited filming. back when they did the second lot? We'll not talk about that. We'll move on from that because uh, <laughs> no, I did not. But the reason why I brought up that fabulous day was because in between filming of the overlap. I saw Twitter going crazy because this is when we got told that Sander Berger was leaving. And that's kind of why I was in a little bit of a depressed mood talking about the Blades at that point. Yeah. But people seem to like the fact that I was very, very down even before <laughs> the season had even started. But anyway, uh, I, I was, yeah, I was depressed, but I was only depressed because obviously Illiman and Sander both going very, very quickly. It felt a bit... Fjort often Dean, even though it wasn't anywhere near that at the time. Uh, but um, what do you think about Gus Harmer uh, when we signed him? 
So Harmer, I was really excited. I always said, uh, as we were coming out of the championship last year, I thought Harmer was one of the best players in the championship. We you're the championship guy. You are the championship guy, Ole. So you must have known all about Gus Harmer and how good he was, even before the semi-final of the playoffs and the final of the playoffs when I started to notice of him. <laughs> yeah, he had actually had a fantastic season before that as well. I know obviously Jokeres took a lot of the credit at Coventry. I know he took all of the main event, but towards the end of the season, it was actually Harmer's goals that had dragged them into the playoffs, never mind then taking them through that semi-final and the final where he scored as well. So his impact as a sort of player who really showed up when his team needed him, as well as his wider play contributing to their sort of fantastic season. Yeah, I was really excited for him, to be honest. He was very much one of them that I said in the summer, if we're going to go out and buy the best players from the championship, such as Gustavo Harmer, I would be delighted. Mm -hmm. So when I heard he was coming, when I saw him there with his shirt and he was paraded at Bramall Lane, I was very excited for this one. And uh, yeah, he was one that I can't, I can't complain about the signing because if I had the money and you'd said to me, how would you want to spend it? He's exactly the kind of player I would have been looking for and that I would have wanted us to bring in. I think it just shows the gulf of quality between the Championship and the Premier League because he was one of, if not the best midfielder in the Championship that season. Streets above so many. And, he was... and I, yeah, I'm not saying that he's not had a good season because I think in a in a poor team, he's had a, a decent season, but he's still, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying he's not good enough for the Premier League, but God. I remember back in the day when you were too good for the championship, you were good enough for sort of mid-table to, towards the top. Nowadays, you're nowhere near it. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to talk about, do you think we made the right decision at the time? A hundred percent at the time that we made these transfers, no question. One hundred percent, it was the right decision. It's the decision that I would have made all day long. And if you'd mm. said to me at the start of the summer, you're going to swap Sanderberger for Gustavo Harmer, I'd have snapped your hand off for that deal because I thought it was the right one. I thought it was progress for the club. And as I say, I thought he was, again, one of those best players in the championship, more than ready to step up and play in the Premier League. Couldn't fault it. Could not fault mm. it. Yeah, I agree because of obviously the contract situation as well. Sander going into the last year of his contract and obviously us getting Gus for quite a few years uh, on his contract. If you could have swapped them, exactly and they they had the same amount of years on the contract so Gus comes in for three four years Sander renews for three four years would you still go Gus yes yeah at long term as a prospect for Sheffield United I wanted Gus Harmer more than I wanted Sander Berger obviously in the transfers I think we lost a little bit I think Sander left for 13 and off, something like that. It might be Euros that I've seen on transfer marks. I think we signed Harmer for more like 17, but I would have taken that trade. And it, again, regardless of contract situation, regardless of how long Sander was going to be here, I respect mm. everything that Sander did for United. I don't want it to come across like I'm slandering him or that I don't think he was a good player for Sheffield United. Clearly he was, but I would have made this trade all day long if I'd been offered it. But mm. one of the things that I think I hadn't, maybe the one thing that does stick in my mind is actually these are when you look at the seasons they've had since then and even if you go back and look at last season maybe the thing that we hadn't appreciated is how different they are as players and the different skill sets mm. and values that they brought to their clubs because obviously we use Sander in a very specific way people have often mm. tried to use him in a number of different ways we heard what he was like at Bruges where he was deeper he was controlling a tempo we came to United we didn't think he could do mm. that we played him further forward tried to get his creativity out at Burnley they again tried to move him back and let him dictate tempo, whereas Harm is not that kind of player. He's a combative midfielder who wants to be playing forwards, scoring goals, getting assists. He's not the same kind of player as Sanderberg. So I would have made the swap. I still think that it probably was the right thing to do. Spoiler alert. But yeah, when you actually are doing this consideration, whether or not for United, we made the right decision in a like-for-like -like swap, it's they're completely different players. Yeah, they are. And you, it's perfectly going into me talking about uh, Burnley turning Sander, I'd say turning Sander into a DM. He was always kind of a DM, like like you've just alluded to there. Uh, do you think that was the right choice for Burnley to do that and for Sander's career? Because we obviously saw, and we keep telling Burnley fans, that Sander's better in an advanced position. Um, 
because he for me he got the ball taken off him too much in deep areas. But I'm going to be honest, we don't watch Burnley week in week out. I'm speaking for both of us here because you yeah. go to Bramall Lane, you don't go to Turf Moor. Turf Moor. Turf Moor, happy place. Turf Moor, happy place, <laughs> yes. So um, what are the stats saying about Sander this season? So it's been an interesting season, really, for Sander. He's not been involved at all. When you look at his stats, I've used FB Ref just to do a little bit of an overview look at what his stats look like this season. And he's not been involved creatively in scoring goals and getting forward at all. You can really see it borne out in the numbers. He's... I think he's only scored one goal. He's only got one assist. He's taken a really low percentage of shots. He's in the bottom third of midfielders in the division for the shots taken. He's not doing any shot creating actions. Again, he's in the bottom third in the division in terms of shot creating actions. And his progressive passes is actually in the bottom 10% of midfielders in the division in terms of their shot creating action. So he's not playing the pass or he's not beating a man or creating the opportunity for somebody to take a shot. Where he's being used is in that sort of dictating the tempo type role. We've seen him move further back for Burnley. We've seen him really starting to play passes. He's really playing low margin passes where he's just passing it to his midfield partner, where he's maybe working with the defenders. We know what Burnley's system's like. They're a really slow, patient, possession, build-up type of team. And Sanders has been really key in that. It also stands out how much he has been used defensively. He's in the top third for tackles made. He's in the top third for blocks. He's actually in the top 20% for clearances. And surprisingly, I cannot believe this. I have genuinely run this data two or three times. I cannot believe this is true. It, it, it's blowing my mind. He's in the top. He's in the 93rd percentile for aerials won. Well, S let's Sander be honest. Berg. Let's let's <laughs> let's be honest, right? He should be in that because of his height. <laughs> but yeah, it's completely blown my mind. That that is that is not the Sander Berg I watched. Like obviously, what Burnley have tried to do is they've really tried to take all the pressure off him creatively with the ball. They've tried to stop him from being that player we saw who could be so destructive, putting his head down, running past players, really using his power. They've really tried to get him sit deep focus on your defensive responsibilities and recycle the play, control the possession for us and really keep us ticking. And does it suit him? I, you know, obviously some of those stats are impressive. He's obviously done quite well. But Burnley can see hell of a lot of goals. They're down at the bottom of the division for a reason with us. And I've got friends who are Burnley fans who I have sat down and talked with. I'll be doing a show with one of them tomorrow. I think it's mm. Turf Morehouse. So if anybody wants to watch me, hi, I'll be on Turf Morehouse. Um, but one of the conversations I've really had with him is about... One of the things that they've noticed from Sander is he loses the ball in really dangerous areas towards his final third, and it's putting them under pressure, particularly at the start of the season when they first threw him into their squad. He was making mistakes that created opportunities and shots for the other team. He was really putting Burnley under pressure. Sounds as though through the season, he's got more control. He's got better at it. He's obviously picking something up in training, which is seeing him better. But I personally do not think this is the role for Sanderberg. And I think it's borne out in a lot of those issues and areas that you see. If you go and watch a lot of the goals conceded by Burnley, you will see Sanderberg's slowness in building up really being exploited and actually him losing the ball into creating some of these chances I also think and this is not his fault but I'd be remiss if I didn't point it out he scored a comedy on goal at the weekend oh my god I've not <laughs> seen it I can't watch much of the day when we lose I just can't <laughs> I have not seen it. I'm going to have to go back he, and watch that. So he is the player who plays the... Everybody who has seen Match of Day or has sort of followed football things on Twitter the last few weeks will know that Murich in Burnley's net had an absolute shocker where he let the ball roll under his foot. Sanderberger who plays that pass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, are we blaming Sander for that? Not even a little bit. It's just quite Probably funny to point not. out. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Murich made a mistake the week before as well, didn't he? Kicking the ball straight at Calvert Calvert Lewin, if I'm right. Calvert Lewin, yeah, good yeah, memory. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I, I was actually didn't thinking. Week, so you watched my I, I was thinking three times. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Darwin Nunes, and I'm like, no, that was Gerbich. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I think this is a great segue into talking about similarities, and in the way you're talking about similarities, it's a weird one because. Coventry fans think that we're, pay we're playing Gus Harmer out of position. So it's weird that we think that Burnley are playing Sandra out of position. 
they think we're playing Gus out of position and he should be a lot deeper. What have you taken from Coventry fans on social media and, and the the things that they're saying? Because I, I don't think that's that's the case. I think Harmer is such a fantastic footballer. He needs to be further up the pitch and not as much that way because I've seen him give away penalties. I've see, seen him do silly things defensively. I don't think he's a good defender, but I think he's a very, very good uh, attacking player. So, so what do you think about Coventry's wild uh, comments? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because, again, it's similar. It, Burnley fans might think the same if they watch this and hear us talk. They might think yeah. it's exactly the same thing in terms of what they've seen from him and how they've seen him used. I think, for me, what I've seen with Gus Harmer since he's come to United, I expected him to be a much more tough, tough tackling midfielder. For the last two seasons, he's been among the most booked players in the championship. He's been a player who's in and winning tackles. He's also good at the tactical foul. He's good at being involved in play through the midfield. And he has been a, a big part of not just their creativity, their goals. He has a lot of goals scored, a lot of assists made. But he was really involved as a bit more box-to-box, -box, playing defensively and really winning those tackles. That's the complete opposite. We've not seen that from him at all this season for Sheffield United. In fact, you know, looking at those same stats I looked at for Sander, he's in the bottom 10% in the league for tackles is in the bottom two percent for aerials one bottom 15 percent for blocks made he's not the player who is going out there and being defensively minded or who's matching up to his midfield counterparts to really try and win the ball back regularly that's not been his game at all he's been used so much more going forward and I think that suited him because I think if you're more defensive minded and if that suits your skill set even in attacking positions you're still winning tackles harrying leading the press mm. and that's not the player we've seen so I think we have actually used Harmer the way that the player that I've watched in the Sheffield United shirt, this is how I think we have to play him because I've not seen enough mm -hmm. from him to know that he can go back and do those defensive skills that he did undoubtedly have at Coventry. But they've obviously seen a very different player to the one we've seen at Bramall Lane, I think. Yeah, they have. It's, it's so, it really is interesting how different fans can see different things. But obviously, it, it could be to do with the fact that he's playing in a much, much, much better league. And let's be honest, it is. <laughs> And I think when much, we were in the much, champ worst team. <laughs> yeah. No, better team, better team, harder division. Uh yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy. It really is. The I still think that Co Coventry fans think they're better than us, so we'll we'll I'm sure we'll see you next season. Uh but how have you how have you rated his performances as a Sheffield United fan? Ignore the stats. From your real eyes, what have you how have you rated his his performances? It's weird because forget that we'll do the stats, the good stats for Harbour. We'll do them in a bit. Okay. okay. As a fan, though, watching it, I have mm. to admit, I've been a little underwhelmed. I think I've, don't get me wrong, uh, they've had been times where you've seen him and he's been really, really impressive. His crossing, mm. his ability on the ball, the passes he can pick out, and some of the goals that he's scored have been mm. absolutely fantastic. And I'm not questioning that. And so his impact in certain games has been mm. very big. But they've been in such limited games. He's mm. not been doing it every week. He goes missing in a lot of games. Our midfield is bypassed so easily. And it has been for much of the season. He's been a key part of that. So, again, that's where I'm wondering about this defensive ability that we expected coming from him or that Coventry fans tell us he should have. Mm. I, we're not seeing it because our midfield is so often just completely anonymous and completely bullied mm. out of games. You know... <laughs> He's been called into question a little bit with his fitness at times throughout the season. I know that some fans have gotten on his back about maybe his physique or the way that he's been in games in terms of his fitness. But I, yeah, with my eyes, eye test, I've been a little bit underwhelmed with the impact that he's been able to have. And I really thought he would be a much more dominant place in our team rather than a good sometimes player. I thought he'd be a good all the time player. Yeah, I thought it'd be way more consistent than it has been. He obviously, you alluded to it, he scored that fantastic goal against Forrest on his debut, I believe that was, because the first game he wasn't signed for. And um, yeah, what a goal. What a fantastic goal. Um, but I almost feel like he's come down to the level of the rest of the players. I don't want to be yeah. negative about the rest of the players, but that does happen. I do. That does happen quite a lot. <laughs> yeah. That does happen quite a lot where players sort of uh, get into their surroundings and they're just not quite the player they were or vice versa. You could have a player 
that he's, he's not at the level and the other players bring you up. So, yeah, I do think that's kind of... I expected to see more. I thought he was fantastic against Everton at home, which I think was our second home game, uh, creating all sorts of chances. And every time he got near the ball, it looked like we were going to score a mm-hmm. goal. Uh, obviously, we get- scored two... In- I, th- I was going to say he got I the think... assist, but he didn't get the assist, did he? He played a lovely pass to Archer, who smashed it off bar and bounced it off back of Pickford's head. So he didn't get the assist, but he should have done because he did a I... fantastic bit of work to set up that goal. I all, I think he might have knocked the ball forward for Archer as well for his... Uh, again, it's not an assist because it wasn't Archer's goal. It hit the post and hit Pickford on the back and went in. But I think he, he was large parts of both those goals. He scored the game before, the only goal of the game. So he started his United career fantastically. And he already knows that he can do it in the championship. So mm-hmm. as long as nobody comes in and buys him, which unless it's a team that comes up from the championship and already know what he's all about, I don't think he's done enough this season to warrant himself getting a move. But saying that, I don't think half of the players we expect to not see next season have done enough to, to warrant um, moves to other clubs. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's no. talk about what he has done then, Nick, because, you know, let's we've, we've said there about how he's disappointed us, how he's been a little bit underwhelming. Let's but, put up some but, of his stats because he's Let got... me just say, before you get into that, I love the man. I think he's one of, he's one of, he's probably my favourite Sheffield United player right now. So, Gus, if you're watching right now, you definitely know. If you are, I love you so much. And I think you are technically the best footballer at the club. Oli, go stats. Yeah, so it's four goals, six assists, numbers in this Sheffield United team. That is, we don't (laughs) score enough goals for him to have 10 goal involvements. That's pretty mad given that where we're at as a club at the minute. So clearly he's been the heartbeat of most of the good things that United have been able to do this season. In terms of his shot creating actions, he's actually done really well. He's in the top 25% of players across the division. And again, how given that we are where we are and what we're doing. It's really impressive what he is able to do and how he's creating chances to drive Sheffield United forward. Similarly, he's in the top 50% for successful take-ons. You can see that he's good with the ball at his feet, dribbling past players. And he's also featuring quite highly in those progressive passes that I was talking about that Sander doesn't make. Gus is completely the opposite. So it's almost every stat I've got in front of me. Everything that was red for Sander Berger is green for Gus Harmer. And everything that was green for Sander Berger is red for Gus Harmer because they are the complete opposite profile for the players and the jobs they've been asked to do so far this season. But the stats for Gus Harmer going forwards, his creativity, his ability on the ball, the goal scoring, the assists... I can see why you might want to gamble on him because if in this Sheffield United team you can get 10 goal involvement, what would you get in a good team? Yeah, exactly. And as we say, he could be bringing his level down and and if he's going into a good team next season who's going to be challenging in the Premier League, then who knows? I say challenging. Challenging to stay up, unlike us. Yeah, a competitive Uh, uh, team. A competitive team, yeah, we'll say that. Um, So I want to go on to talking about Sander again. If... if if there's Burnley fans watching this right now, we're probably not going to talk too much about Burnley. So apologies about that. If Sander would have stayed a blade, it, Harmer's, Harmer's not in the picture. Sander yep. stayed uh, in this team, what we are right now. Do you think Sander would have had a better, in, not not goal involvements exactly, but do you think Sander would have, have put in the performances that Gus would have? Because, Heck, he was actually playing Sander in a deeper role. Like, it was Chris Wilder that always played him in an attacking sense. And um, and last season, I think he started the season under Hecky as a bit more of an attacking player. But then he definitely dropped back and he was definitely deeper because we had those other really exciting attacking players around him, like Illiman, like James McAtee, Ollie McBurney leading the line. So Sander wasn't needed as much up there. Where do you think he would have played this season? And yeah, performances wise, do you think he would have been up there with uh, with Gus? Yeah, it's really difficult to predict because obviously it's all dependent on the role and the job that he was being asked to play. Just as a comparison, his stats last season from more games than Harmer's played this year, six goals, five assists. So he only got 11 goal involvements in a promotion season for Sheffield United in a team that scored lots of goals, won lots of games. He would not have had the same creative impact in getting Sheffield United up the pitch, 
enabling us to score goals and really impact games in that way. The question about what Sanders' role would have been at United is about whether or not his consistency as being a player and a leader from the dressing room, potentially from last season, if his role in just making sure that we can keep that same sort of system that we had. We had such a successful cup run in games like Tottenham and others where, you know, we got a system that worked for United and Sander understood that more than somebody new like Harmer coming in. So maybe he would have had an impact in terms of us having a little bit more control through midfield, understanding more what's being asked of him from the coaching staff early on. And maybe that has an impact on our season. It certainly would change the negativity we had to start the year. We wouldn't have been starting the season under such a dark cloud if he hadn't been sold. Maybe we get an early win and that could change everything. And so you can't really evaluate his impact without looking at the morale impact of selling him and what that did to the fans and the club at the time it happened. On the pitch, as a player, I don't think he would have had as big an impact for Sheffield United in terms of the way that Harmer has got us goals and helped us to earn points. In big games where we've really struggled, he has found the moment sometimes that has helped us. We've not got that many points that somebody having as many goal contributions as he has is clearly a significant impact. And I don't think Sander would have had the same. We saw it the last time we were in the Premier League. He often could go missing in games. We didn't always dominate the midfield. You would weigh that you would want to see him do that. And I also always, he hasn't had one this season, but I always had a question mark about Sander's fitness when he was at United. That's true of all United players, to be honest, at the moment. And so I also also can't guarantee that Sander would have been fit all year the way that Gus Harmer has been, given what we had as his experience at United over the last few years. Yeah, Sander's played a lot of games over this season, hasn't he? I think he, he has. has he played, he's played more games than Gus, hasn't he? Uh, he's played the same. He might have played one more, um, but he Ooh, has all... My, my but, stats. Can I tell you my stats on football? Sander Berger, 32 matches. Gus Harmer, 30 matches. I think this is just in the league. Uh, one goal, Sandra, one assist. Uh, sorry, Harmer also played for Coventry. So he's probably played course, the same number of league of games. Of course, that's that's the reason. <laughs> that's the reason. Of course, of course. Uh, the foot foot mob ratings as well. Uh, Gus Harmer nine uh, six point nine eight. Sander Berger. One of them's got a nine. That's insane. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's not going to nine all season. Let's be honest. Uh, 6.98 for Gus and 6.85 for Sander. And do you know what? I think it's easier to stat pad in a defensive role as well. Passes sideways and backwards. Yeah, I get that. But also, when you're getting done every week, it's not really easy to stand out defensively. <laughs> Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there is a reason for that. I think, yeah, it is possibly a little bit easier to stat pad from that position. I think as well, you probably have to take into account sort of Sander has had a red card as well this season. He's been sent off. I think mm. they've picked up a similar number of bookings. So it's not a clear cut either way. I don't think you can use the stats. You can use even potentially the eye test to say it's very definitively one player or the other. But I think we've got more value out of Harmer, given his impact in the creativity, in the goal scoring, in that side of things. And I think the Fort Mob rating just about bears that out, that it's close, but Harmer is the bigger impact, shall we say. Yeah, for such a tiny guy. Such a tiny, such a tiny guy. guy. I also, I would back him. I would back him. I know the stats earlier tell me that Sanders winning aerials. I will back <laughs> this weekend on Saturday. I'm backing Gus Harmer win every <laughs> header against him. <laughs> Odds on that, please, Skybet. Odds on that. <laughs> right, okay. Well, that's a brilliant segue again. It's almost like you're reading my mind, Oliver. Uh, so let's go to the present day. Sander Berger is coming back to Bramall Lane for the first time since he left. <clears throat> what reception is he getting? Mixed. Uh, probably mixed because... It is inherent at the moment, it seems to me anyway, that football fans, when players come back, want to, welcome back, don't we love you? Um, but then there'll be the fans who know how he left, you know, that he was wanting to leave, that he'd push for the move, that he actually did want to leave Sheffield United at the time. And they might be more tempted to give him a negative reaction, to boo him, to try and create that intimidating atmosphere, to put him off his game. And I can understand both sides. To be honest, I'd... Are you going to say who cares? I'm going to nothing it because I, I wouldn't boo him or cheer him, really. I think he was a player who played for Sheffield United. 
his impact was not as great as we hoped it would be, but also he wasn't a disaster. He was fine. And so probably just because of the stakes, because we're playing a team in a bottom of the table clash, because we really want to try and get on Burnley's backs, scare him a little bit, see if we can get him panicking like we did at Bramley last year. For that reason, I'm probably saying let's boo him. <laughs> but it's not actually his fault. <laughs> I don't. You, I don't think he's an Ali McBurney that would relish in the boom no. either. I think he would cower into his shell, bless him. I think he's expecting a, a rendition of uh, he's Norwegian. I think that's what he's anticipating. I'll tell you what: if we win five nil, or six one, or seven two, or twelve nine, I think we sing that song to him. I reckon 85th minute, if we're two or... In fact, no, to be honest, not two goals up. If we're three or more goals up in 85th minute, then we can sting it at him. (laughs) Yeah, it was like uh, Middlesbrough, wasn't it? Um, Season before last, when everyone was singing to Chris Wilder and stuff once. uh, Yeah. Yeah, we were were, were clear. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you've got to be being a Sheffield United fan, aren't you? Uh, and the last question, which I think you've already alluded to earlier on in this video, who came off the better? I but no, think... actually, actually, let's let's go back. I'm not asking did Sheffield United come off the better. I'm asking for Burnley and for Sheffield United, did they both come off better? Is there an argument that they both came off worse, given where we are? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. I, I actually I think would the, say the Burnley that fans the like San, Sander Berger a lot. Yeah. You can, you, I don't know whether it's like we used to just defend him, whatever happened, but Burnley fans seem to love Sander Berger in that defensive midfield role. I'm not 100% sure why. So if you're a Burnley fan and you're watching this, let us know in the comments why you love Sander Berger so much. Um, but... I think that we came off just about better. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree that on the pitch, I think United have got the better end of the deal. I think we would rather have Gus Harmer, and I think, gun to the red, Burnley would probably also rather have Gus Harmer. But I do think that in the system that they're trying to play, Sander does fit that. He's more their type of player than Gus would have been. Um but, you know, there's a reason. Again, there's a reason that they're in the same position we are. And it's because their style of play, while it might be suited to players like Sander, is also suited to getting hammered every week. Yeah, it's very true. And that's why it's going to be a very, very exciting game on Saturday. Can we both lose? It, do you know what? If any two teams go into a game and could both lose, this is the game for it. But uh, it would be nice to see us beat Burnley. It wouldn't be much of a consolation, but it'll probably be the only thing that we can hang our hat on for this season because it's been one hell of a terrible one. And actually, Burnley fans will probably say the exact same thing as well because Burnley's had way more success in the last 10, 15 years. So this is probably killing them even more than us because they are just as bad. Yeah, we're slightly badder, let's say worse, uh, but um, yeah, let's go into this game and absolutely smash them like we did last time. It was it was an incredible game. Hal's going to be doing a match preview on this channel tomorrow, so make sure you tune into that. Thank you very much, Oliver. I want a score prediction. Why not? Let's do it. Score prediction Ooh. for Saturday. Three two. To There's United. goals. There's goals. We know that. Three two United. Both defenses are terrible. Yeah. Okay. Can I say 3-2 as well? Because uh, I think you've no. nailed it on the head. I'm going to say 3-all because we're both as bad as each other. Another Fulham. I hope it's not another Fulham. But uh, yeah. Anyway, let's see. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. If you're still here by now in the live stream or in the video once this has gone live, give us your prediction as well. Thanks for watching. We will see you very, very soon. Sarah. Thanks, Nick.